fiore tu dari tu hiti ya ya pak enan pak yo lain tu ya ri mata mai tai olo tai tai tono tai nui bai ka tonai atai pa tu po ele ele so Atau mata tini malewa. Atau lupa tiari ini tempat tak kita tahu fakta sini. Ayo mai si otomat tak yang aku ya. Friends, that was in Samoan, and simply I was acknowledging the gods and the sacred places of Tainui Waikato that we meet on. I was also seeking pardon in being here to the land and those who guard this land, the river and those who guard the river, sought pardon from King Hu Tohaitia and the Kahuihad Ariki, greeted a host today. Teraumatatini and Leva greeted each one of you as leaders and healers who bring health and well-being to many individuals and families. This morning I share with Tafao Malolu Dean Parsons our work uh, from the Family Center. And in presenting this work today, might we say that this work is not only ours, it's being contributed to by many people, some of them workers in the field like yourselves, some of them our community members, some of them youth. So, dear ones, we have titled this presentation, Oleaso Male Filinga, Oleaso Male Mata meaning, each day brings its own views of what is on the horizon, and each day brings its own choices. Um, greeting, of course, the two uh, facilitators of today, might we say, that we'll try and rush through as much as possible. But on the third bell, we'll sit down and hopefully we'll have some time to share some more with you. Okay, in Samoan, um, in, in our kind of culture, events are really important. Days and the events, the historical events that happen on those days or events of significance are told and retold so that memory is remembered and added to. Referring to these as tayao or mornings that impacted in the main positively on the lives of people, villages, and motu. And uh, of course, mornings of challenges are also recalled. In each of the oratories, uh, these recollections are told and retold. Memories, therefore, of significance are kept. You heard last night about the recalling of memories of resilience and the markers and indicators of those resilience according to Waikato Tainu. Let us recall some historical events in the history of Aotearoa, New Zealand, and places like Samoa, the Cook Islands, and Tokelau, the three Pacific uh, uh, nations that are involved in the study that we have taken now. In 1848, eight years after the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi, New Zealand sought approval to take over Samoa from the home uh, nation. Again in 1878, another, um, another approach was given, was taken to Great Britain to approve its uh, New Zealand's going over to take over Samoa. During the 1880s to 1900s, Great Britain, the United States, and Germany vied for Samoa. In 1889, the three great powers brought in their warships and declared war on each other. A cyclone um, destroyed the warships. So they moved <laughs> as they would do. <laughs> they then, you know, they found Samoans and nature are too powerful, of course. <laughs> so they peacefully caught their ships back to Europe and around a gentleman's agreement, they partitioned Samoa. 
The United States took over Eastern Samoa. Germany took over Western Samoa in return for British interests in Fiji and Rhodesia being protected from Germanic and United States influences. Rhodesia became Zimbabwe. Everything is tied up in the end. The world is that small, dear cousins. 1901, New Zealand's colonial acquisition in the Pacific starts with the Cook Islands and New Way. 1914, First World War that we've been remembering here in Aotearoa, breaks out in New Zealand, instructed by the Allied nations to take over Samoa. Uh, might I say that um, Samoa was the first um, uh, conquest, well, German Samoa, might I say, was the first conquest of the Allied nations in the First World War. So from 1914, direct military rule in Samoa with the village pass system operating. You've heard of the pass system being operated in South Africa. Friends, it's here in the Pacific world before, as you well know the history of Aotearoa. 1918, influenza epidemic killing 25% of the population. These are the official statistics. The fatalities were much higher atrocious stories of kids of 14 bringing up <coughs> siblings, some of those siblings babies, because the, parent, the parental generation had been killed off. Okay. 1922, Samoa becomes a mandated territory of New Zealand under the United Nations. You well know, you know, after these big wars, they sit around a table somewhere in Europe or the United States and they deal themselves with the spoils of the war. Well, these were the spoils. 19, uh, 1922, New Zealand becomes a mandated territory. 1925, Tokelau becomes a mandated territory. 1962, uh, Samoa gained independence from New Zealand rule. Throughout this period of Germanic and New Zealand colonial rule, Samoa responded with Maupoli, and then, of course, Mawa, Tumua, and Puli. These were resistance movements um, throughout. And of course, it culminated with independence 1962. 1950s to 1970s, you well know, migration to New Zealand accelerated. Firstly, introduced through the urbanization of rural Māori population from iwi areas to the urban areas, Wellington, Auckland. Late 1970s to 1980s economic restructuring, of course, you well have experienced the rising unemployment, rising housing challenges, rising responses from indigenous and Pacific populations, e.g. the setting up of iwi and community-based health and community services. And of course, as a consequence of all those movements, the increased Māori and Pacific scholarship that we are witnessing now. <coughs> Again, I take you to our title. Ole aso malfilinga, ole aso malmatainga tila. Each day brings its own views of what is on the horizon. Each day brings its own choices. This metaphor was gifted to the research team by the Papalitui of Aota Samuel Man. This metaphor proposes that rather than being totalized or frozen into the moment of despair and darkness or or Bongsa, that we need to recover our metaphors and our metaphorical language that opens space for another day, another set of choices. Metaphors and metaphorical language are key linguistic devices and cultures where relationships are central to the self. Metaphors are premised on elusive language that gently opens space rather than being starkly defining. Okay. It's one of the linguistic devices, one of the tools in the culture itself that we have been gifted with to open our thinking up to the possibilities of what the cultures may give to us to help with the suicide prevention. Might I say that 
I was so enthused with the earlier presentation by Kathy and Kitty. We see that in, in the situation of suicide, our people might be frozen. Some of the stories that have been told to us during this research uh, project, people are frozen in time and space, totalized into darkness. And the idea is to open that space to more possibilities. So on one extreme of the continuum is being frozen into that despair, into that darkness. The other part of that continuum that we need to transfer us and take our people through with us is the opening of life possibilities, entrepreneurship, whatever that, that life possibility might be. Okay, um, Dafari Malo is now going to let you know some more of the details of our research. Might I say that we changed our names. You will see that most of you will have know us by Kiwi and Nudine. Several years ago, our families called us into sharing some leadership within our Aima. Okay. Now, my name got changed from Kiwi to now Taimali. It was very idealistic of my family. <laughs> Taimali <laughs> means the gentle rising tide. My friends say, she's not a gentle rising tide, she's a tsunami. <laughs> My family are very idealistic, and Farmaro will introduce herself and her name. Tau Falava, I'm Farmaro Ludin. I'm not a tsunami, but more the details person between government and people is what my name gently transfers, translates to. Sometimes. Okay, my role then is just to talk a little bit about some of the research uh, things and to give you some examples and give you a little bit of background of what we were going to do with our research project. So there are 15 Fafalitui focus groups. They're divided into five each, one for Tokelau, one group of five for Tokelau, group of five for the Cook Islands, and five for Samoan. The Whawhalitui focus groups uh, we've divided into gender and culturally specific and age groupings. So you can see elder women, elder men, parents, young women and young men. The facilitation of the Whawhalitui are carried out with partners from each of the cultural groups in the community. So we work closely with Tokelauan and with Cook Island uh, people were partners uh, with us in the facilitation of the Whawhalitui. Samoan Whawhalitui focus groups are facilitated mainly by ourselves, Te Māni Utu and myself. Suicide prevention, when we've gone out to talk to people and invite people into the research, no one has ever said, no, we can't do that. Uh, so we had a really wonderful response. So suicide prevention has really attracted all of the cultural communities we're working with to participate. We also engage our cultural partners, especially from the Cook Island and Tokelau groups we're working with, in the whole process of translation, transcription and analysis of each of the findings from Whawhalitui. The groups are either hosted at the Family Centre in Lower Hutt, or when we're working in Porirua, we'll go to a community venue in Porirua. We work these groups in terms of facilitation to ensure that the highest, there is the highest protections for participants from all of the kāinga, the kōpūtāngata and āinga. Just to give some examples of some of the learnings. One of the things I really want to acknowledge this morning is that Te Rāwa Te Wakahoru Assessors Panel uh, when you were deciding on who should take out these projects, we got some feedback and you recommended to us we should include some parents whawhale focus, whawhale tui focus groups and that was a really good idea. So we've gone ahead and done that and it's really contributed positively to the research. Parents whawhale tui focus groups identified challenges faced in particular by their generation raising our children 
our young people in New Zealand. As some examples, parents identified they need some additional supports within their families and communities. They identified the need for help to find appropriate language and ways of talking about suicide and its prevention. They identified using words like suicide as really a uh, very direct uh, kind of word and so other sorts of ways were needed and some help in finding the languaging of that. They felt that suicide prevention was best handled as families within their own communities. They also identified it would be much more effective to look at these issues of suicide and its prevention through specialised and culturally based, community based responses. When languaging and speaking about suicide prevention, some of the learnings for us have been, it's not just elders and parents that find the issues of suicide hard to language, it's also young people who really struggle just as much as elders and parents to find ways to speak about suicide. It's not just elders and parents that find the issues of sexuality hard to language. Young people struggle with these and found sexuality hard to discuss amongst their own generation and even harder with elder generations. Some examples from our elders. There were few indigenous words or cultural stories of suicides from our different cultural groupings. Suicide, when we were talking about some of the history of suicide and we were asking them, well, what do you remember? Because these people you know, in their ages that they were, about suicide at home. And it emerged that suicide in the home countries really only began to be known about and, and uh, in their communities at home and villages in Morton from about the late, late 1950s and forward. Suicide beha suicidal behaviour and sexuality was defined by some whaiwhafalatui as tapu, or forbidden and protected areas. They're not areas we go into without being very conscious of protections and that they are not to be spoken about without these. So some of the challenges for us is identifying ways to work within the tapu boundaries and identifying ways that increase the protections. When we began to talk about causes, some of the things that really hit hard were the most common causes that were being identified by some of the groups were the love relationships. So this generation is obviously not the first generation to fall in love to do this thing <laughs> all humans do. But what we didn't, we were struggling with as a challenge is what's causing the intensification of these love relationships to the point that someone will want to die as a matter of rejection or, or other matters that arise in that love relationship. The parents identified the need for help to prepare their young people for these love relationships and particularly within the context of that preparation that it, in the context of tapu and sexuality within today's realities. <coughs> and bringing you back finally to ole aso mana whirina, ole aso mana tila. Each day brings its own valid views of what is on the horizon. Each day brings its own choices. Dear friends, uh, we have had quite a lengthy relationship, quite a long relationship with Tainui Waikato here. So, our relationship with the Tangata Whenua and the land with which we meet, on which we meet today, is well established, well woven, with many fine mats and many bonangos. <laughs> established. So please forgive us for not bringing a gift. There, yeah, it's woven, and it's bonamut right through the ocean down to Samoa. Dear friends, uh, we are here as Pacific peoples from Leba. So we wanted to gift this to Te Raumata who's part of this partnership with Leba. 
This is a work by a uh, Tokelauan artist who in this work speaks about cultural fusion. You know how people took us down cultural fusion before we've even built a scholarship to understand cultural fusion. <laughs> but here is what it looks like. And I can bet you uh, our own cultures would have some good uh, teachings about us, uh, to us about cultural fusions. Sarah Jane last night raised the whole possibility of maybe, you know, when we meet in these meetings, we learn too much from each other when we do not know some of the paka papa around the concepts that we may be talking. What cannot be avoided is in these love relationships, there are now Māori Samoan, Māori Dongan, Tokelauan Māori, you know, these intermarriages, and we in our scholarship have not caught up with that reality. So my dear friends, may we meet in love. Here's from us. There are many other learnings in this project. <laughs>